watching Over the Edge from Event Horizon with John Michael Godier. And we're back with Joe Scott. Now, if you could get an implant, would you? And what implant would you get? What, what, what aspect of yourself would you like to enhance technologically? Well, I've never been the, the biggest early adopter. <laughs> yeah. I mean, when there's a new phone, I don't rush out and get it. So I doubt that I would rush out and get something that has to be drilled into my brain. Me neither. Yeah. But um, I'm also not the latest adopter either. So once, once, this, once the technology is proven, once there's other people that are braver than me that have gone out and done it and it's, uh, and it's beneficial to their lives. And um, I mean, I, I might be one of the first... 30 or 40 percent of people that do it maybe but i certainly wouldn't be one of the first 10 or maybe 20 if that I, makes sense i would be among the last probably I, really? I'm, yeah <laughs> i'm not i'm not really a a big fan of of for somebody that talks about technology and alien civilizations and everything i'm actually somewhat of a luddite so <laughs> <laughs> and i actually sometimes i even ask myself if i even want to know the question the answer to the question are we alone because what happens if we you know, SETI detects an alien civilization, and it's absolutely, utterly frightening. It's a machine mm -hmm. civilization, like something from Mass Effect that, you know, controls the galaxy like an immortal dictator type of thing. Do I really want to know about that? So I do, I do mm -hmm. ask myself those questions. Now, What's your thought on uh, Medi? Uh, I think it's dangerous. Um, yeah? Yeah, I don't think it has a very high chance of success. But at the same time, we have absolutely no idea what's out there. And to proactively try to contact it seems to give up our, 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 it gives up our hand of cards, so to speak. I would rather know about the civilization and then ask the question if we want to contact them rather than actually go and just blindly, uh, you know, send out messages. But this is something that we have no control over because anybody can blast out a radio signal if they have the resources to do it. And, um, uh, it's... You know, but the current Medi stuff, I don't know that that really has much of a chance of success without, you know, because you, if, you know, you, you beam towards a nearby star system and you don't repeat your signal, you are someone's wow signal at that point, if they just happen to catch you. So you're, you're yeah. going to be a mystery to them. And um, that's kind of where that, that stuff is right now. But if yeah. we ever did a really concerted one, like a giant, really expensive omnidirectional beacon or something like you know that you could do but it'd be really expensive that i think would be dangerous uh, ultimately mm. i would rather listen but what, what are your thoughts on it what do you think well i actually interviewed um doug vacoch vacoch i never think i'm saying his name right um i guess he's the the head guy at medi yeah and um uh i mean i kind of lean toward it being kind of dangerous but then at the same time i'm like but like kind of like what you said, we're, we're putting out radio signals all the time anyway. Like, do we even need to send out a specific message? Because if somebody finds our signal, they could probably trace it back to us and know we're here. Like, if, if any if anybody out there is dangerous, they, I mean, cat's out of that bag, you know. But the one thing that he talked about that I thought was an interesting point was that by thinking about what sort of messages that we want to send to an alien species, it kind of helps us to think about who we are and how we want our species to be. It's more of an introspective, internal kind of thing. Um, it kind of it's it's like a thought experiment that yields interesting results. So I thought that was I thought that was an interesting way of looking at it. What would what would really be interesting is if they if they got a response. You know what would it, what would yeah. an, what would an alien civilization say? Would they say? Be quiet. We're trying to do radio astronomy, <laughs> or would they say, <laughs> "Would they say, what do you taste like?" You know, um, what? I'll say, bring back Seinfeld. <laughs> bring back Seinfeld. Yeah, exactly. Or, um, or they complain about the ending of Lost or something. Um, <laughs> but, it made no sense. Yes. So uh, I do wonder about that too. If we could even, but the the truth of the matter is, we probably couldn't decode it. You, yeah. You run into a really, really. The, the language barrier would be the biggest we'd ever conquered. And there are languages, human languages from the past that we have no idea what, you know, where to start as far as deciphering them. Yeah, and we created that. And we created that. So if we were talking to an alien civilization that, I mean, say they communicate chemically, so they're sending you out chemicals. <laughs> what? How would you decipher what that means, you know? Um, yeah. But I, but it well, is and, interesting. And that, that's not out of the, I mean, how many species do that here on Earth? That's, sure. that's a real thing. 
That's a real thing, yeah. And it could, I mean, there are thoughts that it could w get way more complex communication that way than it does here mm -hmm. on Earth. Here it's pheromones and things like that. And, uh, yeah. but, but no, out there, whenever can... I walk my dog, I'm always just like, I wish, I wish I had some idea of how he perceives the world through, through smell the way he does to be able to pick up so many clues just from sniffing a place where somebody had been, you know, hours ago. That's, that's, that's an amazing thing. It's amazing. And animal intelligence itself, you know, where you, you look at a dolphin and they never cease to amaze mm -hmm. me with their abilities. Mm -hmm. And, you know, how far back is this, you know, how far behind is this evolutionarily to a human? At what point does a yeah. dolphin become the second civilization on planet Earth? And whether we make it that way yeah. or not, you know? And some... Actually, I always wonder why there, there's not an intelligent, well, I mean, human-level intelligent species underwater, considering the, the vast biodiversity down there. I mean, I guess dolphins are closest, but... You know, they don't they don't build structures and stuff like that, you know. The thinking on that is that it's because living in an ocean is too easy and you don't need it. Um, you might oh, you might okay. get a, an octopus or you might get a, you know, a dolphin. But see, a dolphin evolved to go back into an ocean. It, it you know, it's a mammal. Oh, that's true. Yeah, yeah. But if you look at the actual sea creatures, they just there's no need for the intelligence because they pretty much have a smorgasbord that they, you know, they've got down there. And that's interesting. That's been advanced. I don't know if I buy it or not, but what I what I do think about though is if you did have an intelligence in the ocean, it does not have the physiology because of the living in the water to actually build a civilization. You know, it can't harness fire, smelt metal, or do any of those things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So maybe that's another solution to the Fermi paradox: is that most intelligence is aquatic and stuck, can't leave its planet. Yeah, like I think about Europa. You know, we want to go to Europa and dig under the ice and see what's down there and all that water. And, you know, we, we might find life, which would be interesting enough. But what if we found, like, an actual underwater Aquaman civilization or something? <laughs> you oh, know, it'd be that amazing. They couldn't, you know, get out of that, that liquid environment, but, you know, still had the same level of intelligence maybe that we do. Or and, and it, it may not even know there's a universe out there because all it sees right. is a wall of ice, you know, and can't uh, can't get out of there. Um, yeah. But it is tantalizing. Europe is probably the most, as far as the search for life goes, I think it's probably the most tantalizing object in the solar system, even more so than Mars. Just because. Yeah, I really can't wait to get something out there to drill under the surface. That's going to be amazing. Now, what excites you about space science coming up this year? Um, missions. What What are you most excited about? Oh gosh. Um... I don't have the stuff in front of me. I I, I shouldn't even say this out loud because who knows yet. But I might actually be able to go see the the Falcon Heavy launch next month. Oh, that's cool. I'm trying to work that out. Seeing the Starhopper test start to take place, that's going to be mm -hmm. exciting. Um, which apparently is going to happen this week, starting out. Supposedly. Um, yeah, yeah. They're, well, they're they're gonna. This is my understanding. I could be wrong. I can always be wrong. They're going to start with like one engine, just kind of like static firing it on the pad. And then they're going to build up to three engines and start doing hover tests. And and probably by the end of the year, they're going to you know get some, some actual height on it. But I mean, just seeing that coming along is exciting. Seeing Orion going up, seeing actual uh, people on the Crew Dragon and hopefully on... Wait, not Orion. I meant the uh, Starliner, the Boeing Starliner. Yeah. Actually seeing humans going up into space from American soil again is going to be a hugely important moment, and hopefully we'll see that this year. I would like to see more, you know, I covered Bigelow Aerospace recently and, and their inflatable habitats, um, and it got me a lot more excited about the possibility of having large, like, commercial space stations and space hotels and stuff like that. That's not something that would happen this year, or maybe even the next five years, but, you know, that's, that's kind of Blue Origins thing. And Jeff Bezos, he wants to put millions of people living and working in space. And so he's kind of working on the, the launch systems to get them up there. But we have people like Bigelow and maybe some other uh, private companies working on the actual habitats that people could be living in. That's super exciting to me. Just just kind of opening all that up, you know. And then we're talking about the moon again and we'll, we'll see what happens there. But all of that stuff, like it's, it's one of these things where like I, I, I didn't really know about it or didn't think about it much until I did a video about it. And then I kind of had to look into it. And then once I did, I was like, oh, this is really cool. You know, it's it's been astonishing watching all this unfold because it looked so bleak for a while after the retirement of the space shuttle. Mm -hmm. And the U.S. was so dependent on on Russia for launching. And now all of a sudden 
we have multiple vehicles, you know? Oh. Yeah. And then also, you know, the SLS, the NASA's big heavy lift that, you know, providing it survives, I don't know if it will or not. Yeah, it's starting to look starting bad. to look a little <laughs> starting to look a little bleak and with things like yeah. BFR, you know, with with uh SpaceX, it could be frivolous because, you know, you have a an actual commercially viable launch system that's just as big, just as capable. Everybody check out Joe's channel, Answers with Joe on YouTube, and like, subscribe, and etc. to this one. That was a bit of material that went over the edge. A bonus clip from a full episode of Event Horizon. New episodes every Thursday. So do be sure to hit subscribe. The full episode should be on your screen right about now. Thank you.